Okay. Hi. Um, so my name is George. Um, I'm. I guess I'll probably I guess give you a bit of introduction as into who I am. Um, I'm actually a haematology registrar in Northwest London, but um, prior to doing medicine, I studied chemistry and then went into biophysics, looking into computer simulations. Uh, when I was at, um, uh, so I ended up doing quite a lot of statistics and computer work then. I then went off before I actually, when I finished medical school, um, I actually went off and delayed my F1 for a bit and um, worked in um, epidemiology and clinical research in Johns Hopkins in America. Um, just sort of building up a sort of um, experience working in sort of epidemiology. Uh, that was actually into the sort of looking into the outcomes of people with kidney transplants. I then, um, I then went on and did a master's in statistics, biostatistics and epidemiology. Um, and um, I now do a PhD in which I sort of work in sort of actually in imaging, turning images into numbers and then back into images basically. Um, but um, I guess in addition to that, obviously, um, I, I sort of became interested in nutritional research, um, partly from sort of reading about the, the, the problems associated with farming and so on and so forth, and then end up moving toward a plant-based diet. And so um, I'm really it's quite an honour to be able to give this sort of talk, uh, which I never thought I would end up combining these two areas of my life. But anyway, um, so I've kept this as... I kept this sort of quite simplistic, um, but if you're if people want more, then you know I'm happy to go into more into further detail anywhere. But what I'm sort of hoping to cover is really just sort of some key statistical concepts and the review sort of basic principles about pivot. Sorry, this seems a very wordy slide. I've tried to keep it less wordy. Um, there's a few, there's basically three areas I want to try, try and cover, and that is kind of the effects of multiple testing and p values. Because if there's one thing within research that I see you know, when just reading papers, and that is, and that is the failure to, to adjust for multiple testing. Um, I'm going to talk about regression and introduce you to sort of the principles behind regression using some simple examples. Uh, and then just sort of try, hopefully, to show you that many of, these, many of the principles and the issues associated with regression are present in really a lot of research. And then from that, talk a little bit about confounding and bias. And then I actually just wanted to introduce you to the, to the idea that you know, statistics is not a sort of, it's not an old science. It's a very fast and forward moving area of, meds, um, of research. And that in the last couple of years, you know, there's been great strides in terms of improving what we can do with statistics. Um, and in my personal experience, I find that a lot of medical research is is very stuck using sort of quite old traditional methods. And actually, there are newer things that we could use to be able to pull out associations and understand the way that things work, um, which, because they're not familiar to people, don't end up making into um, trials. But I actually think I think would be are really would be really are really important and will be really important going forward. Um, okay, so I'm just going to talk about what are random variables and random distributions because statistics is all about understanding randomness actually. So a few definitions: a random variable um, is a function that converts a a value um, into a real number. And then we actually do this all the time um, in, in, in medicine. For example, um, we turn quality of life into numbers using qualities. We turn um, depression into a depression score. We, we enumerate things all the time. And we sort of take it um, for granted, but actually it's a key part of, of uh, it's the first stage in any statistical process. And then we talk about a sample space, and the sample space is all possible events um, or all possible results from an experiment. Um, so, for example, um, a random variable could be the side of a coin, head or tail, 
and the sample sp space would be all possible options for that, so heads or tails, and that's quite a small sample space because there's only zero and one. Um, or a random, variable, a, van, a random variable could be the result from a roll of a die, and the sample space is the set of one to six. Or uh, the, random variable, the random variable could be the results of rolling two die, and then the sample space increases quite dramatically because it's any possible result from sampling, uh, from rolling the two die. Um, and then using sort of the axioms of probability, uh, we're able to make some predictions about how often we would expect to observe any particular random variable within that sample space. For example, in, with the coin flip, we would expect half of our coin flips to be heads and half of our coin flips to be tails. And in the example of the die, we would expect each side of the die to have an equal chance. And so we're just using probability to understand how randomness appears. If you take the example of the two die, then you end up with, um, you look at all the possible permutations of the die roll, and you see that the probability um, of any particular result from, the, from rolling the two die, which could be anything from two, because the smallest value you can get is a, is a roll of one and a roll of, you know, each die pulling out one is, is only is one out of 36. Um, and the most likely or the expected value would be a result of seven, because in that the combination because we get six combinations that bring out a number seven so six out of 36. now if you plot that as a histogram you end up with this and this looks this sort of starts now looking like a, a probability distribution um it's showing you just what is the probability of any one of those particular things occurring uh, um, outcomes occurring so this isn't too complicated i think we can all kind of understand where this is coming from so sort of dice and coin are examples of discrete events um, and they have specific outcomes and, there's a, and they, they have a specific probability and we model these for example this is what we would describe as being a probability mass function um, and that's for discrete events however if it was for a continuous variable such as height or weight we'd use a probability density function and the most famous probability density function I think people have ever come across is the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution, sometimes called the bell curve. And that looks like this. Now I've actually, I have put the equation above for it, which is the function, uh, but I don't expect anyone to really, uh, just, just so it's there and as much as anything. The only thing I would point out is that this shows that any value of x, so x is on this x-axis, um, could be from infinity to infinity. So, it, so this curve just goes off to infinity down the far end on the two ends. Um, and the most like, and this is centered at zero. So zero here is the most likely or is sometimes called the expected value from this probability distribution. Now, the logic being that if you have any value of x, you kind of read off what the probability is for that value of x. Now, that's, that is an oversimplification. Um, for, those of, um, for those of you who have done or remember the value of sort of doing um, integration, you actually know any particular value on this curve will be zero because it's so, the probability of having any particular value is so infinitely small. But to simplify things, you can say that just by reading off here, you end up with a probability. And that's kind of the logic of how these things work. With the Gaussian probability, because we know from the axioms of probability that everything, this, this, this underneath this curve is every possible, prob, uh, po every possible event that could occur, and it all should add up to one, we can say that if we know that within this center of the sample, 95% of the, of the sample, sure, sorry, is contained underneath this area of the, of the bell curve of the Gaussian distribution. So anything out here is less than 2.5 because they both add up to five to make up the rest of the sample. Any anything that event, any event that occurs of these extremes should occur at 2.5% um, of, have a 2.5% probability or below. Um, and that's something that we sort of, I think a lot of people will have covered 
probably before or have experience of covering before. Now, the normal distribution is a good model to, um, to explain random distributions of continuous variables. And these will include height, weight, blood pressure, you know, white cell count, hemoglobin. Um, and this is an example of how it would map against, um, this is actually of height. Now, this is actually real data. This is from, this is actually very old data though. It's from, um, it's from someone called Francis Galton, who was a 19th century statistician. And he measured the heights of a series of people, um, parents and children. Um, and he's really the father of regression. So it's sort of a historical concept. And the reason I point that out is because this, these numbers are actually in inches. And so this would translate into, a, into sort of centimeters, about 165 centimeters. So they're a bit shorter. These are adult men. And so they're a little bit shorter, I think, than the average height of adult men of this age. But as you get, the point here is to point out that the normal distribution here maps very nicely onto this, onto this sample. And so we know that samples do, so this is not just a mathematical concept. These do actually map to real events. So this is the same data. This is, these are the normal. These are the distributions of the parents and the children from the Galton uh, sample. And if we want to say, are these are these um, are these samples different? We basically just map it onto them a normal distribution. So this is the normal distribution for the adults, and this is the normal di distribution for the children. And to map normal distributions, all you need to know is you need to know the mean, which is um, given by this sort of vertical line, and you need to know the, uh, the standard distribution or the sometimes all the variance, and that gives you the width. Um, now, as you increase the numbers, you'll increase, uh, you'll reduce the amount of variance, uh, but that's we won't go into that in too much detail. But basically, you can map any uh, continuous variable with those two values, you can map onto a, a normal distribution. Now, if we want to know, are these sample, are these two populations the same, which is largely what we're doing in statistics? Uh, we ask, are these distributions in any way similar or are they overlapping? Now, actually, we don't need to know the second sample. What we need, we don't need to know what the normal distribution of the children is. We just need to know what the mean value is. And we ask, is this mean value, what is the probability of this mean value being within the normal distribution of parents? And so we know that the probability of being um, uh, anywhere below this dotted line is, is a 2.5%. So there's 2.5% probability of somebody being within this normal distribution if they are below the dotted line. So it gets a bit wordy, but it's, you kind of get the idea. And then if we go, the probability of being below this dotted line is less than one. And then being below this dotted line is less than 0 0.001, um, i.e. the probability of being within this distribution ends up being very, very low as you go below here. And the probability of the children uh, being having the same height as the adults ends up being less, a very low number, <laughs> less than 2.2 times. Two. That's actually, um, that's sort of a computer way of writing it. Um, it's actually times 10 to the minus 16. So, the probability of the of the of the average child being within the height being within the population of the adults is very very small and that's essentially what the p value is telling you it's not telling you anything particular it's it's telling you that they are not part of the same probability distribution so Probability distributions are a way of making, basically what I've said is probability distributions are a way of making um, predictions about what you would expect within the null or the, or the, or the population of interest. Uh, they are in effect a way to model what you would expect to happen by random. They, they model randomness. And you can, you don't have to use sort of things like the normal distribution. You actually, any, you, so, um, sample spaces can take any probability distribution, but we often use these off-the-shelf probability distributions, such as the normal, because they um, they often they generally model what occurs very very well. 
And there are lots of these dis different probability distributions uh, depending on the situation you want. So the normal distribution we use for continuous variables like height and weight, if you have a binary outcome, such as somebody has cancer or they don't have cancer, we'd use a binomial distribution. If you were wanting to model um, um, like a, a time to an event, you'd use the Poisson distribution. These, I don't expect you probably would have come across these, but actually this is sort of, is essentially when you have a problem, you ask what kind of event is it that I'm looking at? Is it a, a binomial event? Is it a probability to a, what is it, is it a time to an, a time to an outcome? Um, and then what probability distribution should I be using to model what this, how this should occur? I mean, what the random, how this would, how I expect this occur by randomness. Now we don't actually use the normal distribution very often. I've talked a lot about it, but we don't actually use it. Um, and there are various reasons for that. We don't use it because we often don't know what the mean or the standard distribution is of, of the null population. And often when we use uh, in a lot of, especially rare events, we don't have enough, num we don't have very many numbers. And instead we actually use the T distribution. So when you read in a paper, you won't read, uh, we use the normal distribution to model this statistical event. You'll read, we use the T test or we use the student T, T distribution. Um, so just to explain why the logic of this is. So this is actually the T distribution. The advantage of the T distribution is you don't need to know the mean and you don't need to know um, well, you do need to know the mean. You don't need to know the standard distribution to, mod to create the T distribution. All you need to know is you need to know the number in your sample. And um, the history of the T distribution is quite interesting. It was actually developed by a guy called William Gossett. And he was a statistician who worked at the Guinness factory in Ireland. And um, he, he developed this, he, what he realized was that very low numbers, like a sample size of three or four or five, the, the, the normal distribution didn't actually work very well. It wasn't very good. And the reason for that is that, that lower, at those lower number levels, you get the probability of getting an event in the extreme ends up being quite a lot higher. You get what essentially is these sort of fat tails you can see here. Um, and he, so he developed the t-distribution to be able to model that better. Now, um, the Guinness factory actually prevented him from publishing it uh, under his own name because they were worried, well, they originally didn't want him to publish it at all because they'd previously had somebody publish all their trade secrets and um, they didn't want him to do it, but he begged them and eventually they allowed him, but they made him publish it under a pseudonym of student. And that's why it's known as the student t-test. And it's the test we use in pretty much all statistical research, um, and you'll read it everywhere. But essentially what it is, it's the normal distribution. But at lower levels, it has a slightly fatter tail. But as soon as you get above a sample size of 10, it looks, and then 10, 20, 500, they look, they, it matches the, the normal distribution completely. Um, but it's easier to use. And so everybody uses the student t-test. Uh, to model the comparison of two continuous distributions. Um, I just thought I would show you what another distribution looks like. And this is the Poisson distribution. And this is a time to event uh, distribution. So this is modeling randomness of a, an, a, an event that happens over time. For example, what is the probability of getting one or more ca cancers during your lifetime? So if, what this is saying is the probability of getting one cancer during your lifetime is oh, was that, about 0.2, something like that. Uh, whereas the probability of getting two cancers in your lifetime will be very much less. Three, four, five. And although then these are never going to zero, but they're getting to very, very low numbers. But this is what this distribution is essentially trying to uh, model. It's modeling what you would expect by randomness. Um, so this is probably the most important thing I would say, most, certainly the most frequently occurring error I read in statistical uh, methods when you read uh, research, and that is the effects of multiple testing p-values. So 
I've sort of said that a p-value is the probability of obtaining an observed test statistic or one of more extreme test statistic, assuming that the null hypothesis was true. Um, it doesn't, you know, that's sort of, that's one of the, that's sort of the formal definition of a p-value and it's sometimes quite hard to remember those words. Um, and the null hypothesis is that the two populations are the same. I personally don't ever, I can never remember this def, uh, definition. I always just remember what it looks like uh, as a distribution, which is why I try to explain it like that. Um, now here's a thought experiment. If you're, pl you're playing darts and you wanna know what is the probability of you hitting the bullseye after throwing just one dart versus what is the probability of you hitting the bullseye with five darts um, compared to just the one. Now, I think we can all, um, we don't need to sort of figure this out mathematically. We all know the probability is obviously going to be higher if you're using five darts than if you're just using one dart. Um, but the same, but this is something that often passes people by when they're doing, when they're publishing research, uh, especially in their methods. And that is that, you know, when you're doing multiple tests or multiple types, of, you're, you're performing the multiple different tests on the same sample you know the p the probability of achieving a statistically significant result is not going to be the same um i when you're fishing for statistical significance you will eventually find something if you fish long enough um and i just thought i would i mean this is i'm trying to simulate this for you um using so what i've done is i've created this um i did this using the computer so I simulated a population of 100 with a normal distribution centered around zero and I randomly selected people a thousand times and I asked what is the probability of getting a p-value below 0 0.05 from this population now the probability is going to be 0 0.05 um, and this is what I've done so I've created my normal distribution I've just randomly taken numbers and I asked what is the probability of getting a value below um, you know 0 point, um, 0 0.25 on this side or 0 0.2 on this side and it turns out that when I do this a thousand times I get the probability of picking something out around here is 0 0.025 to 5% which is what we would expect however now I do the same thing but I take three additional experiments and I run them all at the same time and I ask the question what is the probability of me getting a significant result out of at least one I so I could get um, if I could get from my, I could get a significant result from my first experiment, or I could get a significant result from my second or my third or my fourth. So this is, this is what I'm essentially doing. I'm running the same experiment, but I'm sampling. I'm running four experiments, and I'm randomly sampling from them, and I'm asking, what is the probability of me picking out a result that is statistically significant? It turns out that it's obviously 0.05. Plus, it's the probability of get, it's 0 0.05 in the first experiment, plus probability of getting 0 0.05 in the second experiment, and the third and the fourth. And so I end up with about a 20% probability of getting a significant result. And when I stimulate this, um, I actually get 0 0.18. So it's not the same as just doing it on one test. And if I increase the number of tests, then the probability of me getting a p-value below 0.05 ends up going up quite dramatically. Um, and this is multiple testing, the effects of multiple testing. Now, there are various ways that we can adjust. Now, what you need to do for this in, uh, when you're doing this in your study is you, need to be, you don't change your p-value you change what is your statistical threshold for significance. So instead of using a value of 0 0.05 as your significance threshold, you have to bring it down. You say, well, actually, the probability of me getting 0 0.05 or below ends up going up the more tests I do. So I need to lower my threshold for significance. And there are various ways of doing this. Um, and, but the, probably the best known one is the Bonferroni adjustment. And this is essentially just, I take my threshold of 0 0.05 and I divide it by the number of tests that I do. Um, so for example, if you're looking at um, obesity and you measure four different parameters, whether they be you know, dairy consumption, alcohol, meat intake, and sugar consumption, you've then performed four tests. 
uh, instead of using 0 0.05 as your cutoff, you would use 0 0.0125, i.e. 0 0.05 divided by 4, to be your threshold for significance. And this is essentially what a Bonferroni adjustment will do. It will bring the probability of getting a result of 0 0.05 back to being 0 0.05, which is divided by the number of tests. Does that make sense to people? Or is that... Well, we'll see. I'll show you some. Um... Yeah, it does to me. I think that was okay. quite good. Yes. Yeah. Um, Do you want to ask if anyone's got some, any questions so far then? Yeah. Not fine. Can... Yeah, all good. Okay. Um, do people do it? Um, no, <laughs> they don't. As I say, this is probably the most commonly, this is the thing I observe the most. This is actually a study from 2003. I didn't fish for this, by the way. I was just looking. I went on to a series of journals, um, and I went, this is actually the first journal I went on to, the Journal of Clinical Oncology, which is the flagship journal for, um, for I think, a lot of oncology research. And, um, and I looked for uh, associations with, I, I looked for some nutritional research, basically. This is one of their big hitters in 2003. I was looking at diet and breast cancer. Um, and they sh said that extremes of diet are associated with poor survival. And um, they made no adjustment for multiple testing at all. Um, and they came out with a series of, and, the, and you know, that wouldn't necessarily be too much of a problem, but they came up with these quite strong conclusions that sort of carbohydrates and total fats were associated with uh, poor outcomes because you see these p-values are very small and they did multiple different tests um, and these are by no and i would if you adjusted for if you adjusted your threshold for multiple testing these would not be significant in any way you could just get these by randomness so i'm moving fairly swiftly um, but i'm going to move on to regression um, so I just want to talk to you about what the motivation behind doing a regression, <coughs> performing regression modeling. This is a series of data points from um, one of um, a, a, an oncology center in America, and they were looking at survival. These are these are the results of a series of different. These are different individuals, and their survival time with cancer uh, against their age. And I've made, and so they, they've got very, and they, they looked at various variables. And for example, this is male and female. So male are blue and female are the slightly reddish color. And there's, you can't really, I don't think there's much difference there. This is then when you adjust them, this is when you introduce ECOG status or performance status. And now you start seeing probably a little pattern. You know, you could probably say that. Certainly people with, so um, the larger the circle, the higher the performance status, so, or uh, the worst performance status, the higher the ECOG value. So people with the larger circles have a, have a worse performance status than people with the smaller circles. And you can probably start seeing here that there is a, probably a bit of a pattern in that people who are older with a worse performance status um, seem, to do, seem to have a lower survival time from the point of diagnosis. But this isn't quantified. And the motivation behind regression is trying to estimate what is the relative importance of these different variables on the overall outcome. Now, there are various different ways you can do regression. The most common form of regression is linear regression. Um, and it's the most widely used. It's also quite straightforward to understand. So, um, I'm going to sort of talk to you about linear regression, but that can be that the principles of linear regression can be used for all, nearly all forms of regression. Now, linear regression is based on understanding kind of how you draw a straight line, essentially, just using a straight line to understand the relationship between variables. So, this is the equation for a straight line alpha is the intercept, so that's here. B, um, X is in this, so what I've done here is just to explain what, I'm, what, what, what we're looking at here. This is peak exploratory flow rate. This is a, I've used, I picked this as a continuous variable against height, which is also a continuous variable. As you can see, I've drawn a straight line um, that is actually a best fit line to explain the relationship between height and peak, peak exploratory flow rate. 
And this line can be summarized from this equation where y is the peak exploratory flow rate. So I've changed this. So y here is the peak exploratory flow rate. Alpha is the intercept. Height uh, is obviously height. And then beta is the coefficient. So beta tells you how much, what sort of what the angle is of the line. And that is explaining to you what the association or the how height changes according to peak flow. So what we have here, when we put, when we actually plug the, the real numbers in, sorry, do you want to ask a question? Is all right? Okay. When you actually plug the, um, the numbers in, what you get is um, 5.713 um, for the coefficient, which means that for every increase in peak exploratory flow rate, uh, to make the line height for every one centimeter of height has to increase by 5.713. That's basically giving you the association, and that is called the coefficient. Now, if I then divide them up into men and women, well, you can see that there's a difference between men, men and women uh, with this line. And if I want to in include these into my regression model, I then basically need to ask, there's, I need to say that there's clearly a difference between them. So here, this is the line for men, and this green line is the line for women. And if I want to include that into my regression model, I create what is called a dummy variable, um, and, and then I introduce another coefficient, and this one is gamma. So what my equation is for the men, it becomes the outcome with the intercept of here, and then my coefficient for height, which will actually be the same for them both, because they both have the same angle. But then there's this step up between men and women, and that is gamma. And, this, and the, the size of this step up is, um, I basically calculate. And what I essentially do is I include a male variable. And I say that's one. Now, for the women, obviously, male variable is zero. And that causes the gamma to disappear. So if I then plug the numbers in, what, I end up what ends up happening is that my angle becomes 3.52. And then the step up value is 554.15. And that gives you the equation for the two lines. Now, that's quite a... So, obviously, these, have, these numbers have changed between introducing the new value of gender. You know, the coefficient has gone from 5.7 to 3.5. And that happened... And so, the point I'm trying to make here is that regression models the results you get depend on how many variables you include. Because as you include another variable, all the coefficient results, which are really the associations, um, will change. Okay, so, and, they, and these coefficient values, these measure the relative influence a variable has on the outcome. So, for example, the coefficient value of beta is telling you what is the relative increase um, in the peak exploratory flow rates according to every increase, every unit increase in height. And that is, the, um, and that is essentially what is the association between height and peak exploratory flow rates. And, and as I add new variables, you adjust your estimates. Now, it's, this is, when you include this, um, I guess the point I'm trying to make here, let me just go back to the model. What I'm saying here is that it's 3.52 increase in height for one centimeter in increase, um, sorry, for the peak exploratory flow rate, the increase in exploratory flow rate for every unit centimeter in height is 3.52. Now that's irrelevant of what your baseline height is. 
or um, or that's taking into a fact into account whether your it's whether your that's adjusted for your gender. So that is the increase in height for essentially a female, and then when you include male, you there's a jump up. Let me just move on. So if you were adding in a third variable, you would then change your coefficients again. But it would be adjusted for, for example, if you introduce a third variable of age, you would adjust your coefficients um, a, a further time. But when you then interpreted your coefficient for height, if you introduced age and you adjusted it for age it would be for every unit increase in height for a woman aged zero does that make sense to people because when you adjust age you adjust everybody to zero or you adjust everybody for example when i adjust for gender i adjust the increase in height is adjusted for everybody and the zero value is female so it's adjusted for everybody who is female and if I, if I included age here, then this would change again. But because it would adjust down for age, the effect would be the increase in height for everybody who was female and aged zero. Now, the reason I sort of laboring this point, um, and it's sort of, I find it hard to sort of verbalize it sometimes, and I've never found anyone who's really written it very well. But the reason I'm making this point is because regression models are so important within research. Uh, they have quite important influence. They can influence how we see data. For example, we talk about, there's, there's quite a lot of been made of the obesity paradox. Um, which is this idea that people can be overweight and yet actually not affect their outcome, their survival. Now, if you take a regression model that's looking at obesity and you're looking at it and you include within your regression model cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, and age, when you interpret your results, you're saying obesity is associated with a XX whatever increase in, for example, risk of death. For an individual aged zero with a blood pressure of zero, a cholesterol of zero, and no diabetes. So your outcome here is risk of death. And you've included all these variables. But of course, when you adjust for cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, and age, then you're, when you interpret your effects of cholesterol, you're saying, my my. The, sorry, when you interpret your effects of obesity, you're saying the effects of obesity, given that my cholesterol is zero, given that my, my blood pressure is zero, given that I have no diabetes and my age is zero. Now, obviously, no such person exists, but it sort of explains kind of this concept of the, of the obesity paradox. And that is when you include, because these models exist, when you do such a model, um, how many obese people have a cholesterol of zero, hypertension of zero, diabetes of zero, uh, no diabetes, and an age of zero? None. But it essentially, because obesity causes all these problems, but when you adjust for them in your regression model, then the effects of obesity disappear. Does that make sense to people? Okay. And so this is this is the results of us of um, of a study looking into the obesity paradox. And they've effectively found when they did such a regression model that having a, a BMI of around 35 had no overall difference in terms of hazard ratio. Um, and that's because essentially they've adjusted out all the consequences, all the bad consequences of obesity. Um, now, if you actually read this study, they, they don't say they actually use a linear regression model. Um, they actually use a Cox regression, um, a Cox proportional regression model or Cox proportional hazard model. But um, a Cox proportional hazard model is really a linear regression model. 
I've put the equation here up for the Cox proportional hazard model. Now, I don't expect you to interpret this, but what I'm just trying to point out to you is exactly the same. Um, it's got a few additional terms in, but it's essentially just adding in additional parameters. So it is a linear regression model. So these models often cause call different things, but they all are essentially very similar. They all, um, and they all as a result, um, can be interpreted in the same way. I.e. that when you adjust for things, you adjust them out and you end up with these somewhat crazy um, interpretations of people with having blood pressures of zero and hypertensions of zero. So we're moving fairly swiftly. Um, and I just wanted to move on to confounding because this is probably, this is what epidemiologists spend their life talking about. So confounders um, are things that are associated, are a variable or a uh, parameter with, are associated with both the outcome and the exposure. For example, smoking is associated with both coffee consumption and cancer. And that, adjust, and that causes a confusion of that association between coffee and cancer. Confounding, confounders are just confusing factors. Um, or you could introduce meat into this example, for example, um, for instance. But of course, there's very rarely just a single confounder and there are multiple confounders. And the reality is you almost never can adjust for all the possible confounders. So just to say that confounding is essentially a form of bias. It confuses associations. Um, it can cause positive and negative confusing effect, uh, effects or confounding. Uh, and much of epidemiological research is about trying to remove confounding factors. It's almost impossible to adjust for all uh, confounders. Um, and the way that we adjust for confounders is, usually, is using regression. Um, but the problem is, as you include more and more variables into your regression models, you actually increase the risk of other forms of bias. So this is bringing me on to um, sort of some of the more modern processes and methods of doing statistical research. And I'm hoping that people will start reading about these um, as time moves on. And, the, and the, the one thing I'm going to, and the, the example I'm going to use, I'm going to talk about Mendelian randomization. And this is essentially a, using genetics to bypass um, the, approach, the effects of, of confounding or confounding variables. Now, there are various assumptions that you require for a Mendelian randomization study. Um, and that is that a genetic marker is associated with the exposure genetic marker is independent of the outcome and the genetic marker is independent of factors that confound the exposure associated outcome. I don't necessarily need to worry these, I just thought I'd put them up there for completeness. But to make this, uh, to create, the, create a diagram to show you how this works, this is, these three are the normal confounding sort of triad for your exposure, your outcome and the confounding variable that is affects both of them. Now a gene uh, actually can bypass the effect of confounder and go straight to the exposure and the outcome. For example, if you're looking at um, iron, ferritin, um, and the association with cancer, you can look at whether an HFE mutation is associated with cancer. And because you know that's associated with the serum ferritin, you can say how much you can just, or you can ask is, how much does this change and how much does this change? And you, get an, you, you will then get an idea of how much this is influencing this. Um, or um, you can look at, for example, lactose dehydrogenase, because you know that people who have a lactose dehydrogenase mutation will probably very slightly reduce their dairy consumption. And if you know that this is associated or not associated with this, then you can say fairly conclusively that dairy consumption is probably associated with this or not associated. This seems like quite a bold statement to make, but, um, and, it's, and this is going back to the assumptions. Your assumptions, you have to sort of talk about your assumptions quite carefully, or you have to consider your assumptions quite carefully. But actually it's quite a strong, um, it's quite a powerful um, technique 
because you bypass your confounders. And so this association with this, because this undergoes Mendelian randomization, you know, the, the people inherit this randomly often, um, then this bypasses all these confounding variables. And these are often very tiny mutations. And they're just like a SNP, you know, a single nucleotide polymorphism that slightly alters the effects of lactose dehydrogenase, which very slightly influences dairy consumption. But when you look with very large numbers, which increasingly there are, because increasingly large numbers have had their genomes um, typed, this association, uh, even though it's small, you can expand it up and you can make some very interesting fairly, um, uh, conclusions about what uh, the actual exposure you're interested in really has. And various people have used this and it's been proven to be extremely effective. So this is an example of a Mendelian randomization study and they looked at genetically predicted milk consumption with bone health, ischemic heart disease and type 2 diabetes. Um, and they found that they, they actually didn't find huge amount, but they did find that BMI is associated um, with, um, an increase in BMI is associated with milk consumption um, and a fall in um, LDH and HDL. Uh, associated with milk consumption and you look at they can look at it as according to the allele and then according to the standard deviation of the milk consumption now you can actually do this at home if you want to so there are many consortium have done um sort of genomics essentially on hundreds of thousands of people and you can perform a mendelian randomization study by just going to this website and if you have a little bit of knowledge about it and you consider um, you can actually just plug in your variables and look for the associations. And I've done this. So I looked at uh, lymphoma and the association between lymphoma and lactose intolerance. And I actually found that there's a small uh, reduction actually in this case. Um, these are various different SNPs. There seems to be a, um, a reduction in the number of lymphoma cases within people with who have uh, the lactose intolerance SNP. And you can expand, and then you can sort of make some fairly, and then from that, you can suggest that dairy consumption uh, has an influence on lymphoma. And you can, you can, I've known people who, have, I know one person who's doing this um, and writing papers almost on a, on a sort of weekly basis, just going onto this website and plugging in numbers and then pulling out these associations. And you could publish this if you wanted to. It's quite easy. So just as conclude, confounding and bias is ubiquitous in epidemiological research. Uh, regression is a statistical method aimed at addressing confounding, but itself has limitations um, and can cause some associations or lack of associations which seem a bit unusual um, and there are various new statistical methods that take advantage of molecular genomics and um, molecular biology and genomics uh, which can get around confounding in novel ways thank you for listening um, is there any questions <laughs>